oftentimes people form friendships during their school years that last for the rest of their lives and that provide great comfort and help at difficult times of people's lives and that is certainly the case for our two guests today. My name is Simon Henderson, I am Head of History and Sixth Form at Teasdale School and this is episode 19 of Made in Teasdale. And we actually sat there one night watching John Wayne's State of Ghost Film projected onto the wall wow. while looking down at the scene below. It, it is absolutely fascinating seeing inner city London children dropped into the middle of a working farm. I have very fond memories of growing up in Teasdale. I mean, living in the countryside and having, well, loads of fresh air, loads of space to play. It really is the case that if you come from County Durham, and, and in my case, have lived in southwest London for 40 years, but County Durham is still what I call home. Made in Teasdale. Now, this episode is due to go out a few days after the first lifting of lockdown regulations and on the first step of the path of the government's roadmap out of lockdown. This episode was recorded, however, when we were still in the middle of a national lockdown. And my guests are Sadie Asquith and Scarlett Ballantyne, who grew up together in Cutherston, formed a strong friendship during secondary school, and then as a result of the pandemic and the situation of lockdown, found themselves together again during their third year of university. Well, hello, Sadie, and hello, Scarlett. How are you? We're good. Hello. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Now, you are currently um, in a bubble living together, so that makes this um, this yeah. that makes this interview easier because there's no time delay or there's no weird Zoom or other internet connectivity problems. Uh, it's just you two sitting on one end of the call and me on the other. So yeah. we'll, we'll you can dig each other in the ribs, you see, therefore, and <laughs> if one of them's talking too much, you, you can dispense with the, the um, politeness of, 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 of Zoom calls. So um, let's start with Sadie. Uh, Sadie, talk to us about your uh, early years growing up in Teasdale and some of the memories of that. Uh, so I've lived in Cutherston since I was seven. Um, I moved from Huddersfield and it was just, oh, it was just lovely. There's nothing bad to say about it, really. Other than, other than boredom, now and again, there's nothing bad to say about it. It's like complete and utter safety. Everyone nearby. Yeah, it was just, it was just really good fun. And really good fun. <laughs> yeah, and you, Scarlett? Um, so I moved to Cutherston from London when I was about a year old. And then I moved to Mickleton when I was about 10. And I really enjoyed living in the countryside as well and living in Cuddleston near Sadie and like being near all your friends. Um, and I did a lot of horse riding when I was younger, which was good fun. And yeah, I just really enjoyed it, apart from the boredom as well, but also the buses were just terrible. Oh, That's yeah. another thing that was that terrible. Was but, but no, I really enjoyed it and I really liked living in little villages and communities that way. Mm. It's really nice. And obviously, Cuddleston is the place where you two met. So um, talk, yeah. talk, talk to us about your... your... <laughs> Friendship, which obviously endures to today from an early age, this friendship started. Yeah, I think I sort of forced Scarlett to be my friend. <laughs> yeah. I'd had my eye on her for a while. Um, so yeah, I just worked away at her. <laughs> Sadie had piano lessons with my mum, so she'd come around to my house and hang out. And then I'd come a little bit early when we were seven. But actually, the first time we did meet properly was at a Cutherson bonfire night oh. craft making session where we were oh, making, we're making Viking, Viking hats. helmets. And that's when we became mates. And then actually we became properly good friends and like best friends in exactly. year seven yeah. when we were put in the same class at school. Okay, so that so it all started with that um, epicenter <laughs> of the social world, the Cuthers oh, yeah. Bonfire yeah. Craft session. Um, yeah. So <laughs> you, you were in year seven together, you were put in the same class, so that, that sort of meant that this friendship was going to be cemented 
Um, yeah. Talk mm -hmm. to us about some of your memories of Teasdale School. Um, so we both, we to be honest, looking back on it as well, if I could, I would go back for a day and just relive oh, it would. because it was such good fun. At the time, you think it's quite, oh, this is a bit annoying or hassle getting up at eight o'clock in the morning. But if we could and being around in school with all your friends because we had such a laugh. It was so funny. Yeah. It was just brilliant. I, lo I look back at it so fondly. So funny, just it was just hilarious. Yeah, even the things that weren't funny at the time are now just brilliant. Mm -hmm. It was just, yeah, it was funny. I have to say, um, it, I have to say, as a, as a man with two kids now, just just going back and reliving any day where you don't have to get up till eight o'clock sounds like a, <laughs> sounds like an incredible an incredible day. Um, so, so, to, you, I know that you you did similar, but not identical subjects at GCSE and A level. So, uh, talk to me about your time. Um, in the sixth form and the subjects that you specialised in and why you chose those subjects? Well, I did art, English lit, history and chemistry for two terms, which was, um, yeah, it was interesting. I really, I really loved art and history and English lit. Um, chemistry, I love my teachers, but it just wasn't for me. My brain doesn't work in those ways. I remember you saying <laughs> you only wanted to do chemistry because you liked the periodic, like the periodic table. table. <laughs> and then I quickly realised that that was about it. Um, and it wasn't for me. But yes, um, history, I absolutely loved. English, I absolutely loved it. And art was what I went on to do at uni. So, yeah, it was, it. It was very stressful, but yeah. I enjoyed it. <laughs> I did history, sociology and psychology um, and I loved all of them and I now do sociology and politics at uni. Um, so I completely fell in love with sociology um, and all of the subjects really. I could have probably done any of those three at uni and mm. enjoyed myself. Mm. It was really difficult to pick. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed it. And I, what we miss so much now about being at uni and compared to sixth form is how close and supported you are and how close you are with the teachers and yeah, those little small knit community like that small knit community and it's even those class sizes are more like what you what I expected university seminars to be like than mm. university seminars have especially with COVID have turned out to be that kind of intimacy and that kind of talking about the material and stuff I, yeah. I really enjoyed it no, I love six form. I really did love that. I think I also, for, I think for for you two, obviously, you, you, there's some commonality there in the subject of history, but then there's like divergence in in the other subjects. Um, yeah. But what what you two share is a is a sort of a real um, political consciousness and a real so even since you were, I can remember when you were in like year eight, year nine, a real sort of awareness of the world around you and politics of that. And I do remember uh, you coming into my classroom on the morning after the EU referendum uh, <laughs> result and, and crying because you were really upset about it. <laughs> but but what's what's interesting though is that so you, Sadie, you've gone on to do art and art history and say and Scarlett you're doing sociology but you're still uh, in your work and in your subject choices you're still kind of you're still connected to that that passion for social justice and yeah. and and you're still both very politically engaged yeah okay so, so I with the essays that I choose and the little projects that you get to pick I just kind of specialize it into what I'm particularly interested in during that time so I remember when I was in year first year and we got to do like a little project and something we could pick I did it on um the UK selling arms to Saudi Arabia and how that affects Yemen just because you could pick it on anything you like then in year two I did one about um, LGBT refugees and then in third year and um, for my like dissertation I'm doing stuff on child poverty um, and the government so I can very much put it and best specialise in what I'm interested in and what's kind of played on my mind as like a something I'm angry about at the time and then can write about it and even and also with Sadie's like, I remember we were doing work together the other day and you were doing a mo you were doing an essay about new labor or something i was like you're doing more politics than i'm doing in my politics degree at the moment you're really going into it yeah i think it's i think it's quite hard not to carry on um i think in and especially in writing i always try and write about things that i'm passionate about and i think um art history is such a broad subject that it's it's always quite easy to to wheedle something in 
and yeah and bring something political even even if the essay doesn't call for it um yeah and there's there's always artworks to illustrate whatever political point you want to make um but i think for me in in any i don't know in whatever artistic period that i'm writing about i think the political thing that i find most interesting is the relationship between the artist so who's whoever's making and then the audience and I think um and that often involves class relations and um I, I mean I wrote my dissertation about the Pitman painters in spending more in Ashington and there was a lot in that about artists and audience and how the artists there were part of a mining community and they created art purely about themselves and for themselves and because they didn't want to be involved in the wider art market they were they were penalized for that and and called amateur um but yeah, I think especially coming from a history background at A level, um, my my essays are always context and politics heavy anyway, as opposed to being just descriptions of artworks. Um, but yeah, but I don't think my artwork is political in any sense. I don't know. I think um, for me, even even at A level again, it's always been quite a meditative process. It's always I've always found it quite relaxing. <laughs> so I think, to be honest, I try to steer away from politics. Um, but even if I am responding to something social or political, it's, it's definitely an emotional response, not a political response. But I think that kind of speaks to your, your personalities because, like, <laughs> how can I put this politely? Uh, Scarlett's political consciousness is probably more, um, probably more focused and directed and as a personality, she's quite, she's the one that always organises you, Sadie. And then, yeah. and then Sadie, That's you are, incredibly emotional. <laughs> you are the sort of, you are the artiste. So you tend to be very creative and passionate and, and maybe slightly less organised than Scarlett. And so as a consequence of that, it's interesting that she, she sees the political element of your work in a way that possibly you don't because you're yeah. kind of lost in that creativity. I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't see what, I mean, even in writing, when I write my art history essays, I don't necessarily see it as political. It's definitely, I don't know, it's social. I mean, I've written essays about class. I wrote my dissertation on the Pitmen painters in Spennymore, and that was a lot about class and how um, working class painters are, are normally seen as amateur, and that I found that incredibly interesting. Um, and I wrote a lot in my first year about gender and art, and um and masculinity especially which i found interesting as well so i wouldn't i wouldn't say i'm more on the political side but i mean it's like you said i wrote an essay about new labor the other day so i don't know that is very political what you just said especially I mean, your dissertation oh, is, history is yeah. so, so varied and so interesting and you can just you can you really can make it whatever you want it can be political it can be social it can be purely visual if you're mm. not in the mood it is it's a really fantastic subject so talk to me about so you you both you're sitting in on Galgut in Barnard Castle at the moment. Yes, we are. Um, but, but in the first year of your studies, you were in Manchester City and you were in Newcastle, Scarlet. Talk mm -hmm. to me about how the pandemic slowly started to alter what your degree looked like. So if you can contrast kind of what was happening in the first year and then how that's changed over time. I mean, I mean, for me, it has been, um, it's been interesting. I mean, I started off because I, I do fine art and art history. So my fine art is um, workshop based and yeah, workshop and studio based. And my art history is lecture based. Um, so my studio work in, in, in the first year was fantastic. I had my own studio space, went in every day. Um, and normally I, I spend the first half of the term in the studio solidly and the second half of the term in the library writing essays. Um, so that went, I mean, we've had a year and a half of normal uni. The second year and a half has been interesting. I mean, I've had to, I mean, the studio slowly, sh slowly shut, the workshops shut completely. Um, so I, I mean, I specialise in sculpture. I work mainly in ceramics, glass and metal. Um, so that's been a bit of an issue because I've been at home. I've had to replace glass with boiled sweets and jelly, which that's has been so exciting. Funny. It's like Heston Blumenthal in this part is. It's 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 interesting. Um, um, metal completely out the window. Lots of trips to boys. Lots of trips to boys. Sources. Yeah, 
um and Maxwell's yeah so that's all been shut off completely so I've had to be um let's say resourceful in my, in my final um art history has been interesting we've had no library access so I've had to um use purely online journals I mean I did my dissertation at home so I had to, I had to take that was good because I, I managed to get to the library I had about I'd say 26 books in a suitcase. Yeah, but where did you go? Where did you, you went? Where did you go in Newcastle? Oh, I did manage to do that. I managed, for my, to be honest, my dissertation hit exactly the right point in lockdown, if you can say that, because, I mean, I got to go up to um, Ashington and go to the Woodhall Museum, which was the most valuable experience I had. <laughs> in yeah. my dissertation, I got to look at first-hand sources. But, I mean, if, that, if my dissertation had been now, that, that wouldn't have been possible. Mm. so yeah it has been there's been good points but I mean the, the jelly was a definite lie the jelly yeah. was a lie I'm over the jelly now Guys. Um. so yeah mine's obviously a bit different because it's more there's no kind of hands-on work as such so it has been really d- difficult the process for moving from actually in-person stuff to online um, and kind of when we first started the uni didn't know how to react and lots of lectures were cancelled mm. and exams were changed into essays and they did give like safety nets and stuff whereas this year it's kind of been like right you've done this for half a year now come on crack on you've got to do your work and it is incredibly difficult because I really struggle to work from like my room or from home I very much would always go work Mm. in the library at uni and so that's been really challenging and also like zoom calls and lectures has been tricky but we just have to kind of push through as much as we can and it's also been really upsetting because I both of us just loved uni and I did so many societies and loved the being in Newcastle. So it's, it has been hard, but, but we're getting there. We're getting what, there. What, what prompted your decision? I mean, it might not have been a decision, it might have been a decision that was taken for you, but I presume that you sort of went back a little bit in the second year on, yeah. And then since full lockdown, since January, was there yeah. no option to go and stay or was it just not practical? I mean, after Christmas, there were, I mean, the unis have been, the tutors have been fantastic, let me say that. The unis, however, up above, have, have not in any way. I mean, we got, there were, there's barely any communication after we came back before Christmas. And I mean, I'd had dribs and drabs of emails just saying, oh, you might be back, who knows? And then there was an email after Christmas saying, you know what, if, if you don't need to come back, don't come back yeah I mean I we're, still, we're still paying rent <laughs> we're still yeah. paying sure. rent but we're not that I had the same so I went back from October to December and then I'm, I'm only living with one other girl as well and I could have gone back but they did say look if you don't only go back if you really need to and I thought just in terms of the isolation which was quite difficult in first semester it's much nicer for me to be around here and to be able to you know be because we're in the countryside and yeah. I've got my dog with me so it's nicer to work from home for now however we do both want to go back to you yeah. at some point I mean we are so lucky I mean we're here we've got we've got enough space to be doing what we need to do yeah we've got each other <laughs> yeah solidarity <laughs> but no it, it has been difficult and it's been very uncertain and it's, it's really it's disappointing at, at the end of the day it's just it's disappointing but I mean you've We've got to be resourceful. It, we, yeah. We've learned things that they couldn't have taught us, put it that way. Yeah, and in, in terms of you still paying your rent, yes. your rent, is there any sense that you'll get any redress for that or you're not actually there? You've been told you've been told not to go back if you can possibly yeah. help it, but you're also still paying your rent. I mean, yeah. it's because we're in third year. It's, 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 we've got uni to deal with and then landlords to deal with. And I mean, the landlords... They've yeah. been sent. It was sent them emails. They're not. They're not interested. I think it's difficult because when you go live in the community in second and third year, it's different. Because I know Newcastle Uni have been. If you're not living mm. there, you don't have to pay your rent yeah, in your in student halls. halls. However, not we're not in halls because of we decided to like move out into yeah. the community in second and third year. So we're just with private landlords, which is a bit frustrating. Yeah, signed into contract. Yeah, yeah and you can't get out of it. So I know that when you were in sixth form as well as um obviously studying one of the things that you threw your um passion into was charity work and um certainly doing things with the interact group um <laughs> Garlett, you want to talk to us a little bit about how you've kind of taken that element of what you did further when you were in newcastle yeah so i 
when I was in sixth form, did stuff with the interact with the Rotary Club. Um, and because I actually first went to Rotary Club directly and was like, I want to do X, Y, Z. And they were like, you're too young. Do this in school and um, through interact. And I organised the shoebox appeal in school, which I then did again in my first year of uni, the uh, second year of uni. Um, I was the secretary of Helping Our Homeless Society and I organised the shoebox appeal the same um, when we raised them for a local homeless charity and also we gave some to sh- uh, shelter, um, a homeless charity in Newcastle, which was really good. And I had lots of support from like the students union and from the, the whole team there. So we did that, which was how I kind of translated it across and instead of getting students involved rather than students at school. And I've also done a lot of stuff with LGBT society um, and we I'd organised a quiz in sixth form and we do lots of quizzes, especially with Zoom over um, lockdown. So we do them with LGBT as well. And there's also another society called RAG, which is Raising and Giving where you there's a fun it's like a fun filled week but also you're raising money for charity and I got involved with that just as a part I didn't arrange it I just went as a participant which was really good fun as well so that's kind of how I translated the stuff across obviously it's it's more difficult to to do that stuff at the moment when you're not there you know there's only so much you can do um in terms of helping people when you are helping them remotely rather than actually sort of physically there so you're now in a strange position because you it may possibly not feel to both of you as though you're about to finish university in the relatively near future because you're actually back to where you were <laughs> age seven um getting yes. piano lessons yeah. actually you're just sharing a flat together now and you don't have to make an excuse to go around early to try and be friends with her um so <laughs> what where do you see yourself going once you've graduated what is your is your at least medium term plan in terms of where you go from here oh, I'm not sure it's it's all been muddled up it's really strange because I mean it feels it feels in a really weird way like sort of regressed now we're back home I just want to be at home in Barney I'm I'm really enjoying it which I never thought I would I, I was so desperate to go to uni after sixth form um, I mean, I would I would love to do my master's, but I think in, in the current state of things, a, a year out <laughs> is necessary. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's, re- it's really odd because I never thought I would say that ever. But I think um, I would love to do my master's at some point, but I, I don't think now is the time. <laughs> yeah, it'd be difficult for you to do a master's because if you were to do it, for example, in sculpture or something, yeah. you can't actually go I mean, and do yeah, sculpture. No, it's, yeah. it's just, I can't even imagine it. It's, it's really odd. But yeah. No, a master's is definitely on the cards, but I'm, I'm just not sure when. Mm-hmm. What about you? <laughs> um, I definitely think I'd like to do a master's at some point as well. I'm not too sure when. At the moment, my mind is kind of thinking it's difficult to know what to do with the current climate um, because obviously in terms of jobs or what to do next. Mm. But I am considering doing a PGCE or so PGCE or master's or something along there. But at the moment, I'm just focusing on dissertation stuff. And then I shall think <laughs> about what to do, way, what to do after. <laughs> so, but it's really, it's really challenging being in this position now because it's there's lots yeah. of stuff. I think um, ideally, if it wasn't a pandemic, I probably would have worked for half a year and I would have gone travelling and taken a year out that yeah. way, um, and maybe taught abroad or something. But that's just not happening at the moment, so it's difficult to know what to do. It's like a bit of a pause. It feels like we're just going to have to pause for a bit. Just get a, get a degree first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and then just pause because it is, it's really, it's really bizarre. But I think, um, I mean, I know I for one need a job. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know Scarlett's oh, yeah. you know, dissertation obviously is something that you do independently anyway. So you, if you, you don't have access to a library physically, so that would be difficult same for you for, for dissertation city but in terms of yeah. like how is it looking for you in terms of a final actual physical piece of art is that something that's expected of you the thing is I have no idea at this point which is it makes it harder I mean I've been because I've been stripped I've essentially been stripped of all my material so I've been at home sort of trying to muddle along sort of keep the ideas going but it's just a lot of planning which is is really strange um, I'm I'm not sure if I'm going to be expected to do a degree show. But, I mean, that's that's 
sort of the defining part of a fine art degree is is the degree show at the end and the networking that that offers you um so yeah I'm not sure I, I'm just trying to I'm just trying to keep going just keep keep positive try I mean try and be resourceful and just yeah just just wait wait for the verdict have, it, have, have you tutors given you any sort of guidance um, on what will happen instead of a, fi- a, a final show or n- no not at the minute no I think it's because it's particularly because I do sculpture I mean if if I was a painter I think things would be different I'd, I'd probably have a different mindset on it but um but no the, I don't I don't think my tutors know I don't think they have a clue I think it is it's those above who who sort of control and because Manchester School of Art is part of a wider uni, it's not always at the forefront of of those above minds. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure how it's going to go. I'm keeping positive. I would love to do a degree show. Um, but at, at the point where we are now, I'm not sure. It's interesting you said about a pause because I've said this to lots of people that I've spoken to on this podcast that that, you know, a lot of the attention and focus, rightly so, during the pandemic in terms of protecting health has been on older people so it's about shielding people a lot of the focus at the moment rightly so is on how can we get that those 15 million people vaccinated as fast as possible but Mm -hmm. what's being lost actually when you use that phrase pause what's been what's being robbed from lots of young people are things that are important rites of passage whether it be doing your exams or in the case of you as a fine arts student, that that final show at the end and the ability to network and to show off your work, and that, that just can't happen because you can't have people in yeah. that close proximity. It strikes me that that the longer term sort of consequences of this pandemic when we look sort of 5, 10, 15 years down the line when hopefully there are vaccines and medication and the, the, the actual virus itself isn't a problem. It's that it's that sort of social problem yeah. that's being caused by the virus. It is strange. I feel like um, everyone from like, I don't know, 18 year olds to, I don't know, late 20s, we've all just had to sort of suck it up. And I always thought the defining like point where I'd grow up in my early 20s would be when I when I graduated after uni and all the life experiences that that throws at you but um weirdly enough it's been a global pandemic and I and I think everyone I know has changed and we've all grown up like just like that just from having to yeah just suck it up and it is weird it's really weird but I don't know there's there's always positives that you can pull from situations yeah. mm-hmm. how do you think it's changed and affected you Scarlett? Um, I think it's for lots of people. I think it's p- t- taking a lot of like self and um, like introspection. I don't know if that's the right word, but kind of looking in and learning more things about yourself and about who you are. And people, everyone I know has had lots of self discoveries and stuff, um, and I for one have as well. So it's it, that in that way, it's been paused in that sense for you to stop and to really kind of slow down and look at yourself and learn things about yourself, whilst also being quite anxious and. Um, not being able to really move forward in terms of career and stuff like that. So it's been lots of work in some ways and then a real pause in other ways. Mm. Um, yeah. I think what's obviously important for you two is that there was a friendship there that even though you'd gone in your different ways, like Manchester and Newcastle, and if things had been normal, you you know, you were still in contact with each other and you would mm-hmm. have still seen each other. But yeah, you, you've kind of fallen back on on that familiar you've fallen back on that friendship that was the bedrock of your um adolescence and you've kind of that's helped you through this would you say well it's like it's like time we wouldn't have ordinarily had it's really weird to think about because we, we've always said we want to live with each other but yeah. i think we thought that would be i don't know when we we're like 25 i don't have a clue at some point at some point in our lives but it is it is like time we haven't had it's like being at home is time we wouldn't have had yeah I think, uh, I mean, when you go to uni, you're that, at least I couldn't speak for us. I know we were. We were both desperate to get away to sort of live our lives somewhere else. But um, I've, I've never wanted to be home so much in my life. It is really odd. But mm. it is. It's like time we wouldn't have had. It's, it's strange, yeah. but it's, it, it is lovely in a way. Because mm. we definitely, even when we were out uni, we still were 
completely like best mates and would go visit each other mm. and even when i'd be out clubbing in newcastle i'd see people from home and they'd go oh it's sadie and i'm like no 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 it's it's scarlet it's the because other one still, it's, it's the other one it's because people still get us mixed up and that was even when we we're at uni and now we actually are living together it's very it has very much gone back to mm. to school and you know we joke with each other and we say things to each other that we could not say to anyone else <laughs> um and we're like being quite nasty to each other sometimes but in a funny way um oh, but yeah so we have it has kind of rekindled that in a in a more intense way like mm-hmm. we are back in um c block having english lessons and being naughty and chatting with each other or brought lessons and stuff it's weird it's <laughs> obviously, really obviously even though you're close to home geographically you're obviously distant from home socially which yeah i would mm-hmm. imagine is difficult <laughs> no it has been it has been tricky being away from home and both of us not being able to kind of see our family um but we've very much gone back into using each other as family and as like a support network which we have always which we have always done so yeah it's been difficult but it's definitely much nicer i think both of us have found this it's much nicer doing lockdown in barnard castle and at home than it was being in manchester or newcastle wouldn't you say yeah yeah <laughs> and and you know, it's nice that you've got that very strong friendship and you um, are able to support each other. But come on, let's get the truth out there. When you're stuck in the house with the same <laughs> people, it can get a little bit tense. So um, we'll start with Scarlett. You tell me something that really gets on your nerves that Sadie does that you've noticed that you live with her. Oh, gosh. Um, I've got a few about you. <laughs> So right, I'm gonna let Sadie go first actually, because she's got a few about oh. me, and then I can use that as ammunition to go back okay. at you harder. I think my one thing, my one thing, is when you shout instead of speak. Scarlett oh, yeah. Scarla loves to talk excessively loudly, however close she is to you. I don't have a volume gauge. That in is my one of my favourite things about you, though. It is, it is, it is funny, but it's incredibly irritating. Okay, but that's about it. I think to be honest, I actually know that's it. <laughs> I've only so, got one. Everything else when, I can when deal Sadie, with. When Sadie, I can notice when Sadie's like in a mood or she's in a grump and she very is just little response. And she's done this throughout our whole lives, but living with her has definitely brought it out. And when she's in an angry or in a mood, she she does the silent treatment and, and sometimes just doesn't even reply with words. It's just like scowls across the room. So, so on a bad day, Scarlett's right in your face. Shouting. Speak, speaking. With, uh, we are, she, I mean, we, we're very opposite, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah, so Scarlett's right in your face and you're just dog. ignoring her. <laughs> yeah. Sadie I thinks, love your Sadie dog. Like my dog. He's a work. puppy. Let's just say that. He's a puppy. So he's a he's, little bit excitable. He's yeah. always incredibly excitable. Yeah. I, I see, I, I saw over um, Scarlett's shoulder, because obviously this is a, a video call, that paused on the TV is, is The Crown on Netflix. So oh. um, that brings us to... Um, during your times of downtime and giving yourself yep. a bit of a break, do you have a do you have a film or a series or a book or an album recommendation? Our favorite, right? I mean, I say our favorite film. We've both. <laughs> I, I must have watched it at least five times. I just adore it. It's called How to Lose a Guy in Ten Days. It is the perfect. It's just the perfect film in every yeah. way. I think it was made in the nineties. It's aged so well. It's a brilliant film. It's def- yeah. it's a rom com. But it's fantastic. Yeah. We're obsessed with And I've been watching The Crown, which is, I guess, not yeah. a film, but it's a series. That's yeah. what I've been really getting into at the moment. And I ring my mum. Whenever I speak <laughs> to my mum, I go, this is happening in The Crown. Um, so I'm really, I'm always so late to the game of series and stuff. But And also, I'll say, in terms of a book recommendation, I've, during lockdown, got very much into using audiobooks and kind of listening to them as I'm kind of trotting mm. about. Um, and I listen to one called Girl, Woman, Other on an audiobook, oh, which is really good. That. Um, which I'd highly recommend. Yeah. Good. And I, just Audible in general, because for someone who can't concentrate on reading for too long, that's a good one. I like Mrs. Audible Mrs. a lot. Mrs. Henderson and I have tried to convert the boys. In it. We, this is a film that I've now seen several times. Mrs. Doubtfire. Um, oh, yeah. So we try, we try to get Arthur and Bertie to watch it, but I think it's just because Mrs. Henderson loves it. And you're sort of watching it with the kids, but there's so many different points of amusement in Mrs. Doubtfire. Um, <laughs> Robin Williams was undoubtedly a genius and you watch it lots of times and the kids aren't laughing but Mrs. Henderson and I are absolutely <laughs> beside ourselves because there's just so many little bits that even though it's meant to be a 
film for kids, it's quite clearly lots of the humour is aimed at adults, so we've enjoyed that a lot. So, um, this has been incredibly enjoyable, um, and it, I hope that our hope that our listeners are able to pick up, um, which I'm sure they will, um, how strong your friendship is and how you've been able to support each other through this difficult time. Thank you for giving up some of your time with Scarlett trying to. You. <laughs> trying to badger Sadie into doing a bit more and being a bit more organised um, oh. to speak to the listeners of this podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank it's you. Been lovely. It's been like a little chat in your classroom at a lunchtime. Yeah, it's been brilliant. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. It is clear listening to that conversation with Sadie and Scarlett how much their friendship means to each other and how important that has been to be able to help them through um, a difficult time and help them through a university experience that has been indelibly shaped by the pandemic. It has enabled them to, to support each other and to help each other during a, certainly a second and third year experience of university life unlike they could possibly have imagined when they started their course. So, if you have a story that you would like to share with the listeners of Made in Teasdale, then please do get in touch. If you want to nominate somebody else who you think has an interesting story, then similarly, get in touch. Until next time, stay safe, take care, goodbye.